Hello and welcome to Axel Coral Live. It's really wonderful to have you all with us on those classes watching across the world. It makes it so special to be able to connect you to this wonderful place to the Caribbean. And we are at the Kamabi Research Station and that is on the island of Curaçao in the southern Caribbean. So part of the Netherlands Antilles of three main islands, Aruba, Bonaire and Curaçao, ABC Islands. And we're just north of the Venezuelan coast here. Now, Kamabi is a field research station and it's a wonderful facility for scientists from around the world. It does a number of things. It supports scientists by being able to accommodate them for weeks or months to do their research projects. There are wet labs here, there are dry labs here, and in those labs, scientists can continue the research, analyze samples, set up experiments, really get to grip with the samples they've been taking from the coral reef. Wet labs, fantastic resource. We've got one just behind us here, and we'll be having a tour around that in our next session with Dr. Mark Vermey in just over one and a half hours. But what's wonderful about having a research station near the coral reef, just 50 meters this way, is that you have that second bit, field research station with the field, and that's the name that scientists give to the great outdoors, to the environment. The field in our case isn't a bit of grass, it's in fact the coral reef. So scientists can come down here, find some moray eels, find some water samples, get some new corals and bring in them into the labs to do their research. So it's a really, really special place. Now today on Coral Live we're bringing you a live investigation and that's with me, Jamie and Ellie behind the camera from Encounter EDU and we'll be taking you through how the whole coral ecosystem fits together. And we'll be doing that by investigating something called a food chain or a food web. Now, if you do have the materials in your classroom, we really look forward to you uh, following on with us, following along with us. But don't worry, have a look, and then you can always complete that later. Before we dive into the nitty gritty, uh, some special shout outs and see which schools are joining us. We have schools from Canada, Lithuania, uh, the US, UK, Colombia, Bermuda, Belize and Ukraine. Fantastic and welcome one and all. Um, some special shout outs. Uh, hi you're from Peter's Colony Elementary in the Colony, Texas, USA. It's about zero degrees Celsius uh, with you. That's really, really cold. Well, it's cold for most people. Uh, I'm afraid to say it's a, it's a really tricky 32 degrees here. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Alf E. Hawes Elementary School, who are watching from the US. Hi to all the students there. Uh, we've got a big thank you to Lawrence Intermediate School for joining us from New Jersey, the US. And I've heard there's a big cold snap in the US and especially on the Upper East Coast. So stay warm, stay careful, but fantastic to have you join. And a hello to uh, the Nova Gorivka School in Ukraine and wonderful to have students and teachers join us and hope it's not too cold where you are. And then uh, last shout out we have um, is thank you to INEM Santiago Perez for joining from Bogota in Colombia. Wonderful to have you all with us. Oh sorry, we have an additional shout out uh, to the students at David Leader Middle School and they are excited to join as part of their work in learning about climate change and saving the sea turtles global projects. Really great to have you with us. So what we're going to do in this live lesson, we're going to do a few things. We are going to look at developing knowledge about some of the species, some of the living things that inhabit the reef. We are going to look at some of the processes, so how are those joined up in food chains and food webs? How does it all fit together? We're going to look at some science vocabulary. I won't give them away yet because we've got a little test coming up for you in just a moment. And then we're going to be thinking about how understanding the coral reef 
can help us think about how we might want to be involved in its future. So in terms of format, I've got a little quiz for you and then we are going to go into the live investigation. Afterwards, a chance to answer all your excellent questions that have been submitted in advance or that come up on the live chat. Now, please do share your amazing creations uh, online. Our social media handles are uh, is at, at EncounterEDU and for the hashtag it is Coral Live 2019. So looking forward to seeing your amazing work there. So I think we've got a couple of anagrams, just a couple of science words coming up. Get your bits of food web kit ready and we'll be back with you in just a moment. I wonder how you got on, there was a tricky one in there. I found that first anagram particularly difficult. So those two words, uh, really important words for what we're looking at now. We've got predators and we've got prey. Now predators, those are the animals, sometimes plants, that eat other animals and then the prey are the animals that get eaten. So. We're going to go into our live investigation and we're going to look at a a few bits and pieces here. Uh, Hopefully you have all your cards ready. I had some fun with the team before we left colouring some of these in. I'm going to go through them one by one just so you know what the living things are. They might be new for you. You might have already studied food chains and food webs but using animals that you might find in your local environment. The concepts and the vocabulary is the same, even if this context of the coral reef is a little different. So, I'm going to go through these species one by one, and then we'll try and join them up in food chains, short food chains, and then lastly, we'll try and organise it all in a food web. What we won't do live with you is get the doweling out, get the strings out and make the mobile. That's something for you to complete in your own time, maybe a follow-up lesson or after this live broadcast or even at home. So, where should we start? I'm gonna put a bit of coral as my weight at the moment so these don't blow away in the wind. Uh, In no particular order, I'm gonna go through these living things that you find on the reef. So first up, we have seagrass. Seagrass, a flowering plant, provides a very important nursery environment for a lot of fish species, uh, but you find that in patches near coral reefs around the world. Next, the green turtle, a marine reptile, one of seven turtle species around the world. We'll be thinking about what this eats a bit later. Here we have the sun, the important part of pretty well every food chain until we get deep into the dark ocean, but that's a whole nother lesson. Uh, So the sun powering photosynthesis in plants and algae. Next up we have the phytoplankton and phytoplankton is a science word for microscopic plants well, plant-like algae that float on the ocean currents. So this isn't life-size, these are tiny wee microscopic algae. 
The word plankton really just means drifters. And we've got another type of plankton here, another drifter. But this is a type of zooplankton, an animal drifter. And this is a copepod, the most abundant animal on the planet. There's um, about 1,300 billion billion of them are in our oceans. And they're fantastic, converting, eating the algae and turning that into sort of bigger protein blocks for, for larger animals. Copepod, about the size of your pinky fingernail or even down to the size of a pinhead. So tiny wee ones uh, related to the same sort of uh, got crustacean, so related to uh, lobsters and crabs. Aha! We have the staghorn coral, um, a wonderful uh, example of branching coral. Uh, if you were with us yesterday, we'd have learned a lot about the coral polyp. So coral is made by a tiny animal related to jellyfish and sea anemones, uh, and that's a coral polyp. They divide and divide and divide, taking minerals from the water to create these amazing structures, and they use their tentacles to catch zooplankton from the waters. Now we heard from Mark earlier, if they're very lucky, they might catch a fish, but that's very, very rare. Um, they also have a special trick um, to get to superpower. Um, so we can come on to their special superpower trick a bit later. Here we have the parrotfish. So colorful uh, in real life that we were just struck for choice about what to colour ours in, so we ended up not colouring it at all. Uh, but the parrotfish, so named because its mouth is shaped like a, a parrot's beak, scrapes uh, the coral, some of eating the coral, and also scrapes algae off the reef. Uh, next up, we have the tiger shark. Now, tiger sharks more likely to have a bit of a sort of tiger um, colouring and well not colouring so much but the sort of the patterns on them and uh, voracious eaters on the reef um, so it would be great to see how you've coloured in your tiger shark a few more stripes uh, than this one and last but by no means least we have the manta ray and so the manta ray coming through the ocean and we're just having a look at um, this mouth here where we've got it sieving through the ocean and eating lots of amazing plankton um, and using that huge majestic creatures gliding through the ocean. I'm just going to start to sort out um, these cards down here and, and pick a few for a food chain. We're just going to monitor the live chat to make sure that all those explanations that came through, there's nothing that needs to be clarified. And I'm just going to pick for my first food chain. And what we're looking at with a food chain is how these different living things are connected through feeding relationships. And we'll talk a little bit about predator and prey. So the first three that I'm going to look at, I have a, where's a good place Ellie, here? Back a little bit, there, perfect. I've got the tiger shark, I've got the staghorn coral, and I've got the parrotfish, none of which will blow away in the wind, of course. Uh, and I want to think about what eats what here. So I've got to think, does the tiger shark eat the coral? Does the parrotfish eat the tiger shark? If I think about it, I'm thinking, well, that shaped beak, that mouth is going to be probably eating the staghorn coral. So I've got energy from the coral going in to the parrotfish. And I'm reckoning that this tiger shark might have had a little snack on a parrotfish once in a while. So predator eating parrotfish, the prey. Again a predator eating staghorn coral, the prey. 
And when we look at arrows in a food chain or a food web, and depending on what stage you're at, you might be looking at arrows or not, the arrows go in the direction of the energy. So you'd have an arrow from the staghorn to the parrotfish, because energy is going from the staghorn into the parrotfish. And then we'd have another arrow going from the parrotfish into the tiger shark as it's eaten. The arrows don't go in the direction of what eats what, but instead of how the energy comes through these feeding relationships. I'm just going to check in with the live chat and to make sure that the species descriptions were okay. I can't, I see, I'm seeing, I'm finding, getting nods from behind the camera, so hopefully that's all, all okay. And I'm just going to find a few more um, species here and think about how they may be related. Here we go, and I'm back here. So I've got my planktons here. I've got my phytoplankton, the microscopic plant-like algae. I've got my copepod, the tiny wee relative of the shrimp and the lobster. And I have my manta ray, the swooping sieve of the sea. And I'm just gonna consider, again, the feeding relationship of short food chain. So it's like links in a chain coming along here. So I'm reckoning that the tiny animal is going to eat the tiny plant like algae. And then the manta ray is gonna swoop through and sort of almost hoover up all those tiny wee beasties. And again, I have a food chain with energy coming this way. And I'm just before we do the food web, trying to join all the animals together, connect these food chains, I'm gonna introduce two more science terms. They're producer and consumer. What I'd love to do, is see if there's space now, just to put the sun down here. And so I've got energy coming from the sun to the algae. Now in food chains you might have studied already, all that are more common in your local environments, that sun may be powering trees and other types of plants, and they're generating that energy through a process that is photosynthesis. So they're called producers, those living things producing energy or matter from the sun, producing those sugars from the sun. Then we have the consumers. So the consumers are eating other living things. They're not solar powered, they're eating other living things. So here we have a consumer, sorry, a producer, a consumer, and another consumer. Where we have sort of layers of consumers, we can start to give them separate names. So we might say this is a primary consumer because it's eating a producer, algae or plants. And then we might have a secondary consumer because it's eating already a consumer. So we'll just give you a moment just to have a think and make sure those terms are nicely uh, shared in class. Anything you want me to go through again, please put it on the live chat. Otherwise, I'm just gonna get all of my cards out and I'm gonna see how we can start to connect this in a series of food chains to start to create an idea of a food web. So, as I mentioned before, the sun is super important because it's powering those producers. So I'm gonna bring the sun up to the top here. Then I'm gonna think next about what are those living things out of my selection 
that are going to be solar powered, that are going to get the energy from the sun. And we've already done the phytoplankton and I reckon the other one is going to be the seagrass, so the plant that lives in the ocean. So now I'm thinking about what are the different animals that might be eating these producers, this algae and this, this uh, plant, the seagrass. Well, I know that we've had the copepod before eating the phytoplankton, the algae. What about the seagrass? I'm reckoning it's going to be the green turtle. And already here, we can see two food chains starting to form. Starting with the sun, producing sugars and food here, and then these next animals coming along. Now, who's going to be eating the copepod? Well, that's going to be the manta ray we already know, but also the staghorn with its tentacles. We know about the parrotfish eating the staghorn. And then last, but by no means least, we have the tiger shark, as we discovered in our first food chain. So what we have here is an idea about how different animals and other living things are connected through food chains starting with the sun, then coming down through these uh, producers. Then we have some consumers, and we can call this green turtle a herbivore. And the reason why we can call it a herbivore is because it eats plants. Another bit of science terminology that we could use is carnivore. And that's when something eats another animal. As we're gonna give an example here, we've got the uh, tiger shark eating the parrotfish, and that's an example of a carnivore. In terms of the energy flowing from the sun through algae and plants down the food chain, so the arrows will be going this way. So just give you a couple of minutes just to consider that, and we've got a, two questions, two prediction qu questions for you just give you a chance to settle through, post some more questions in the live chat if you would like to, and we'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes. I wonder how you got on. So those are some of the uh, little facts that we've already covered um, during this live investigation. So first of all, we've got the importance of parrotfish to the reef. Uh, <laughs> so you probably got um, that it nibbles away algae. And the importance of it nibbling away algae is that clears the way for corals to start to settle on the reef and find a new home. They can't do that if there's sort of seaweed or little tufts of algae in the way. Now, the pooping bit is quite a funny fact. If you can imagine them gnawing on a bit of coral like this, then you have this coming out the other end as a fine powder. Now that fine powder is often the sand that makes up the glorious uh, beaches in the tropics. 
The second question, looking at uh, what green turtles eat. So they eat, as an adult, just the seagrass, as we've seen from our food chain. But when they're younger, they eat a whole range of different things, uh, including worms and crustaceans like small crabs. So when a animal, an animal is eating plants and other animals, we call it an omnivore. Oh, and just at the right moment, we've got all of these cards blowing in the wind. So I'm gonna just gather those away. And we've got a great time now to go through the questions you've submitted in advance and also, um, uh, and also to, sorry, thank you. Um, and also to look at the live chat that you've got coming here. Very sorry, we've just um, got one of the science crew um, was about to trip over something. And so we've just avoided a little trip. We've, we've got the live cables coming to the studio here. So, coming back, uh, we've got questions from Peter's Colony Elementary. Uh, <laughs> what do you think is the most endangered part of this food chain? Well, that's a really, really great question. Um, so there are stresses across um, the whole of the food chain. We've had a big problem in the Caribbean from parrotfish being overfished. And so that's one angle that you could say is the most endangered part. But then corals nowadays are facing huge issues um, through a number of threats. Uh, they are being resilient, they are coming back, but uh, obviously we need to be careful about their future. But as you can see, um, that also sharks are having an issue um, with a lot of overfishing. So between 100 to 150 million sharks caught each year. So all across the food chain, there are different pressures um, that are happening. Uh, so it's really great here to talk about how to keep an ecosystem healthy. It's looking at all parts of the food chain. I suppose you could say on the coral reef that the coral is one of the more important because it helps to keep the 3D structure, the sort of underwater city for all the other species but it does need help from a range of other animals as well. Uh, Peter's Colony, what can we in Texas do to help the coral reefs? I think at the moment, just learning how special and wonderful they are. They cover just 0.1% of the ocean and yet support 25% of all marine species. So I think the first step um, is to create a coral reef display, perhaps, and share all your knowledge with parents and the wider community. Then we can think about some of the threats. We're looking at that a bit more tomorrow. And we can think about how you might want to, you know, begin to take action on those. But the first thing is to learn more and really enjoy the reef because it's a very, very special place. Here we go. Um, from Cartagena, in Colombia, students there would like to know, is a sea cucumber a producer or a consumer? Now, a producer is an, a living thing that gets its energy from the sun and a consumer from other animals and from other tissue. So we'll find that the sea cucumber, hoovering along the sandy bottom, of the sea near the coral reef is what we call a detritivore. So eating maybe a mix of dead skin and other dead tissues and getting its nutrients from that. So we call it a consumer because it's not getting its energy direct from the sun. Is a coral reef uh, shark a consumer? Very much so. Uh, fewer sharks around, but they're definitely consumers. In fact, we could call them apex predators because they're, they're at the top of the food chain, uh, bossing, bossing the reef as it were. So really at the top there, definitely a consumer. Uh, next question coming up, we have, what is the energy flow in plankton? Well, depends how deep you wanna go into this, but just for today's live lesson, um, the energy flow is really simple. We're getting energy from the sun to power the process of photosynthesis, turning carbon dioxide, and water into sugars and oxygen. So 
that is the process of energy, that energy coming out as sugars and being available uh, to the wider ecosystem, building their own tissues and then other animals eating them, so animals eating them. Uh, what do sea cucumbers eat? We just covered that. Uh, what is the tastiest animal on the coral reef? Wow, we. Well, most of the tastiest ones aren't really around anymore. So if you look at something that was a delicacy in the Bahamas, the conch and the famous for conch fritters, those have really been overfished. So the conch in, in, in the Bahamas is one example of a very tasty um, animal being overfished. Um, but we have had this before. We'll go back to the sea cucumbers and maybe uh, we'll look at the delicacy of sea cucumbers. I mean, you know, there's, there's um, octopus, there's, um, and also sea urchins I saw being caught in Timor-Leste, in East Timor, as uh, for the Japanese export market. So there's a lot of delicacies are in and around the reef. Uh, again, from, we have from Cartagena in Colombia, what is the most aggressive animal on the reef? I'm going to go for one that we don't find in the Caribbean. I'm going to go for one more common in the Indo Pacific. I'm going to go for Nemo. Nemo is incredibly aggressive. So the clownfish, very, very aggressive animal, very aggressive fish, jealously guarding its an enemy. And if you come close, we'll definitely come out and attack you. Much more aggressive than a shark is normally. So sharks might be curious, but not normally aggressive. So Nemo definitely more aggressive than the shark. I don't know, is there a shark name in Finding Nemo? Shark name? Yeah, what's the name of the shark in Finding Nemo? Answers, answers on a live chat somewhere, please. Brilliant. Uh, so we have live questions coming through. Um, I said the copepod was so important, why is that? So if you think about uh, the food chains we've been looking at, we've got the producers, so all the algae, and then across the whole ocean, you want the more complex sort of basically proteins for the larger animals. So it's very difficult uh, to be a huge animal in the ocean without being a bit of a carnivore. So what the copepod does right at the bottom of the food chain is it's turning those tiny microscopic plant like algae into larger building blocks for life. And it's incredibly abundant and it does that all over the planet and not just in and around the reef. It's called Bruce. Bruce. Nemo more aggressive than Bruce. There we go. Thank you very much. The shark in Finding Nemo called Bruce. Who was that who got that through? Um, Jacksonville in the US would like to know what is the best defense mechanism of an animal on the reef? And that's Tyler wants to know, well I can tell you what the most disgusting one is. The most dis disgusting is definitely the sea cucumber, uh, which ejects its guts out of its backside as a dis disgusting way of discouraging uh, any would-be predator. Uh, but we have the, on, on the reef here we have sponges, which have uh, chemical defense mechanisms, so chemical warfare. And also we have a little bit of that coming from the coral, but they've got harpoon-like cells. Um, in their tentacles, the, the coral polyp as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on on the reef, but the, uh, the most disgusting one, definitely held by the sea cucumber. Let's move this into a bit of shade. Um, Snappers class in Bermuda, um, one of our first graders wants to know why is the coral reef so colorful? That's an absolutely brilliant question. So there are some colors uh, that come from the coral. So, but it's not the coral that is in fact colourful. So what we have is we have a jellyfish-like animal that's building this white skeleton, white structure out of calcium carbonate, which is chalk, limestone, the same mineral. But I said before it's got a superpower and the superpower it has is having tiny algae called Suxanthellae live inside its tissue. And those Suxanthellae are different colours. So really the coral polyp gets its colour from these tiny algae and those are sort of plant-like colours. So you've got 
reddish ones, orangey ones, yellowish ones, browny ones, green ones. Sometimes you'll see uh, blues and lilacs in coral, and those are really from the sunblock proteins that shallower coral, you know, corals um, make. And it's a bit like having that you know, fluorescent coloured uh, sunblock uh, that some people have on their faces. Now a lot of the other colours um, come from different species of fish and especially sponges. Uh, so sponges are a whole range of wonderful colours. Uh, we're talking about sort of blues and purples and oranges and reds. So often a lot of the colour you see on a reef isn't coral but is in fact sponges. Um, David Leader Middle School um, are there any endangered species of coral? If so, which ones? And that is Arjan uh, from David Leader. Thank you, it's a really great question. So there are a number of, uh, of uh, species that are endangered. We've got incredibly rare species like the Pacific Elkhorn. We've got the, the, the sort of main Elkhorn here. And that, I mean, the Elkhorn is a really interesting story. Um, and it's, uh, if you've got your um, coral live stickers, we can probably send you one, that's got an elk horn uh, coral on it. It really started to decrease. It was, the Caribbean was really famous for, for elk horn corals and the decline was, was quite uh, noticeable. And it went onto the endangered list. But through a lot of hard work, it started to come back. And I think that's one of the big stories of coral conservation at the moment. Is this, while certainly there are problems and there are threats to the coral reef, and we've had a lot of questions about this during Coral Live so far, that given the right conditions, coral reefs can recover. And it's really about giving them that helping hand and creating the right conditions for recovery. And so, yes, there are threats to coral reefs, but given the conditions, they'll come back. We've got an island um, here, Bonaire, and it had, first of all, um, Hurricane Omar, um, and that was in 2008. Then there was a bleaching event when the ocean gets too warm and can cause corals to die off in 2010. But since then, the reef has made a full recovery, so there's coverage in the same areas as it was um, before those two events happened. There was a big hurricane here, um, I think it was Hurricane Lenny in, 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 in the 90s. And in the 20 years since then, those reefs have started to recover. So given the right conditions, having good management, not overfishing, shows us how reefs can recover. So yes, there is endangerment, yes, we've talked about a couple of species, but given the right conditions, we can support them to recover. I mean, I think if we're, we're, I think you're talking, coming to, that question was from um, the US. And I think what's really interesting is, is the story of the bull, this, to go away from, from the reef for a bit, but to conservation in the US in general. And there's a really good example of after a book called Silent Spring was published um, by Rachel Carson, and that looked at the impact of pesticides on, on farming and how that had a wider impact on the, on the wildlife in the US. And it was discovered that after, you know, that it was harming the bald eagle, after um, DDT was banned, um, the, the bald eagle has made an amazing recovery. So I think it shows that you, know, you can have human impacts that cause uh, certain species to become endangered, but also action can really help make a difference and help those endangered species make a, a really great recovery. So let's see what other questions we have. The glare is so great. Um, Independence Elementary in Louisville, Texas. Um, how long do coral polyps live before they become part of the reef? That's a great question. So when a, a coral spawns and the eggs go into the, into the ocean, 
They're then looking for, the larvae's looking for somewhere to settle and then will develop into a, into a polyp. And that's just a single polyp. So in terms of science, uh, corals breed both sexually and asexually. So once they've found a great place to live, and if you join us uh, for the Meet the Expert session after this, we'll show you some of the experiments being done here to find out what corals like. And then it starts to do asexual reproduction, and that's uh, where basically it splits in half and clones itself, and buds and buds and separates and separates. So there's two polyps, and then four polyps, and then eight polyps and then more and more and more until it starts to resemble a coral colony, which is what we sort of traditionally think of as a piece of coral, but that's many, many, many individual animals in there. Uh, Jacksonville in the US, Annabelle would like to know, do corals get hungry? Um, not sure what, <laughs> bit of a splash there, but um, corals, do need to get enough food. If they don't get enough food, um, then they will slowly starve. And we see that uh, in the process of bleaching where they lose their algae inside them. So they lose a really important part of their food, over half of their food source, and then they will slowly starve. So yes, they do need to get enough food. And that, that um, is an incredibly important part of any animal staying alive. Uh, Jevon would like to know what is the fastest animal on the reef? Wow, the fastest animal on the reef. Well, I certainly know that going back to the copepod um, would, would um, relative to their size, um, beat Usain Bolt um, at their escape velocity. Um, but we're thinking we'll, we'll go, go for the uh, mako shark um, as one of the fastest um, sharks definitely on the reef. And that's getting up to I think, and I can't remember the exact number, but I think about 40 miles an hour there as a, as a pretty fast uh, animal on the reef, fastest shark. Um, Huntington Beach, California. Um, we know that overfishing is an issue, but is global warming also an issue? And that's a really great question from uh, Huntington Beach in Cal um, California. And so reefs have two types of threat or stress on them. They have local stresses or local threats. That could be anything from water quality, um, dirt getting onto the reef from a coastal development, overfishing, as you pointed out, uh, too much uh, sewage or, or water running off from agriculture. And then they have what we call system-wide threats. And those are mainly to do with, with global warming, with the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And those higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are causing two things, one of which is warming, which we've covered just now, and the other is ocean acidification, which we're doing a live investigation on tomorrow. The warming piece, uh, corals like a very particular band of uh, temperature between about 23 and 29 degrees Celsius, most around 27, 28 degrees Celsius. And if it goes above that, then the relationship between the coral polyp and the algae that lives inside its tissue starts to break down. They eject that algae and they lose their, basically most of their food. And so if that lasts for too long, if the temperatures don't drop and the algae don't come back, then the coral polyps uh, will starve to death. And so the global warming is, does pr produce a, a stress on, on coral polyps and these, these warming events um, do create um, mass coral bleaching on occasion. Um, we've heard that news from, from, from the Great Barrier Reef but corals are able to be more resilient to these wider threats if everything else is going okay. So it's a bit like in life, you can cope with one thing going badly, but if it's one thing after another after another and you haven't had any sleep and you, know, you can't find your shoes and everything else, 
then life gets much worse than if it's just one thing at a time. So you can talk about what's called a multi-stressor environment, where we look at how all these uh, interact and how if we start to address the some of them, then the corals can be more resilient to the others. And I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, here we go, we've got, uh, sorry, Jacksonville, US, have you ever been scared diving on the reef and is it dangerous? And that's from Julie. Julie, I don't like snakes, uh, even on land. And so when I was doing some work uh, in Timor-Leste, um, I was doing some filming underwater of how the community there were fishing and there was a sea snake that was being far too curious and that was for me was a particularly scary moment. Uh, so definitely don't like snakes on land, even more don't like snakes in the sea. Uh, snappers class in Bermuda, what is the most abundant fish on the coral reef? Do you know what, um, snappers class in Bermuda, you have completely stumped me there. And so we'll find out for you. Surgeon Which ones? Surgeon fish. Surgeon fish yeah. on all reefs. Because I know that you will get different communities of fish around the world. It's probably going to be a fish that we don't find in Bermuda. It's probably going to be one on more of the reefs in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but we'll find out for that. My, my um, mental Wikipedia uh, has deserted me momentarily. Um, and last, from Independence Elementary, Lewisville in Texas, um, we have, what is your favorite animal thing about the reef? And it's got to be the Christmas tree worm, which are just awesome. If you've never seen a Christmas tree worm, um, find a photo now and have a look at it. Um, thank you all so much for your amazing questions. Thank you for being part of this live investigation. Do remember to talk about the vocabulary and the concepts and processes we've discussed. So we've got predators and prey, we've got producers and consumers, and then we covered herbivore, carnivore, and omnivore as well, with a little bit of detritivore, which is definitely higher grade stuff. Um, and then that's all connected through food chains and food webs. Thank you so much uh, for being part of Coral Live and part of this session, and look forward to seeing you again this week. But for now, it's goodbye. Bye-bye.